Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below. Um, maybe you can see my screen that says die studies. Yes, we can. Good. Well, I got a picture of a couple of ancient Romans striking coins. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, why should we do die studies? Well, we can put things in order for chronology and uh, detective things are issued simultaneous. It's some evidence for mint organization. Uh, we can estimate the coverage of a sample. We can tell how thorough your sample is, how much we're missing. And we can estimate the number of dyes used for the issue. Now, who's in my audience? I'm hoping it's interested amateurs who want to know how these studies are done and what they yield. But I'm also interested in talking to serious researchers who have questions about what can be really inferred from dye links and how we should deal with the numerical statistics. I'm gonna work on the setup and the linkage and identification first. You've got coins with two sides and each side comes in distinguishable varieties. And the variety of one side can change while the other stays the same. That's absolutely critical. The coin there is a Cricpusius denarius of the Roman Republic and one of the most studied issues. And here are two varieties of it, and you can see they're really quite different. They have a little difference here. This has a thunderbolt that has a branch. But the reason this issue has been studied so much is it has Roman numerals on it. Here's a 44 and here's a 327, so they're very, very easy to distinguish from one another. But one of the main points I'm making today is that the same idea works for coins classifiable in two ways. They don't have to be dye varieties. They can be other sorts of varieties. For example, let's suppose you're looking at Constantine's Sali and Victo comedy types at Lugdunum. They come in four different mint marks, and here's one of them. Well, when are they from? Well, look at this. Down here, I have that same field mark and mint mark on a coin of Licinius. But the other three issues don't have Licinius in common. So this one must be simultaneous, or virtually so, with the time when Constantine was minting for Licinius. I wanted to say that there are lots of ways to classify. You could do mint marks, you can do types, you can do emperors like I just did, obverse legends. There's a lot of RIC groups with uh, several obverse legends in a single group. Maybe you could put those in order. We have bus varieties like this one. There's lots of things you can do this with. But I'm gonna talk about the simplest case for an actual dye study and I'm going to label obverse dyes with capital letters and reverse dyes with lowercase letters and talk about a case that I'm not claiming is true, but just the simplest possible case where dyes are used one at a time until exhaustion, they break, then you replace it with a new one, used the same way. And we can have a dye pair, like maybe obverse dye, capital A, is used with reverse dye, lowercase a. Then reverse dye A breaks. We bring in reverse dye B. It's still used with obverse dye A. It breaks. We use reverse dye C with re obverse dye A. And then maybe reverse dye C stays OK while A breaks. And we replace anvil dye A with B. And we go like this. And we have pairs, dye pairs, and we have 
dye chains, and we have dye links. For instance, capital A is linked with capital B. I'm not claiming dyes are used this way. I'm claiming if they are used this way, maybe we get a chart like that. But don't let the choice of letters fool you. Look, when I started, I didn't know which dye was going to be first. I was just saying, I have a coin with this pair, and I have a coin with this pair, but I didn't know that was going to be first. When you start to study, you're just finding coins from the same dyes. You're identifying dyes. This labeling will be a relabeling when you're done. And the labeling alone doesn't assure the left to right order. Maybe D was first with G. You could reverse this whole first chain and it wouldn't change any of the links. And I don't know whether E and F were used before A, B, C, and D or not. Please don't be fooled by the choice of letters. We need something like die breaks or die weld where to help put this in order. And I'm going to go back to this pair, AC, and this pair, CB. Maybe C was fresh when it was first used with A, and we have a coin which really shows C in good shape. And maybe C gets a die break somewhere along the way and then is used with B, uh, which suggests that B follows A. And then that would put this whole chain in order. Now, here's that exact same stuff, except I took out one link, the DF link, and I'm putting it in a completely different order. So sometimes we can do things with chronology, but you have to be really careful because the order is not determined by this chart. This chart says, yeah, A was used with little a, but I don't know whether it was used before B or not. Now here's another way to arrange die identities. And this one, let's suppose you have obverse A used with reverse A, and obverse A used with reverse B, and obverse A used with reverse C, and then reverse C used with obverse B. And if the chart is simple enough, you can write it out like this. And here's a beautiful example created by Lars Ramsgold. And I'm gonna interpret it for you. All of these are the same die. This was used with this reverse. And the same obverse was used with a different reverse way different, not just a different die, but a whole different type. And then here's a third type used with that same obverse die. And this is the same as that, is the same as that. So we've got uh, five coins here used with three different reverse dies. And then we see that reverse die was also used with this obverse. And that obverse was also used with this reverse. And you get a beautiful chart as long as it's simple enough, where you can actually look and see if you like the dies. You could maybe even click on these things and make them bigger and check out the links to see whether you thought the links were identified correctly. Now, I'm going to have us all do a little uh, die study here for a second. Uh, here's a top coin from the Santa and a bottom coin. Let's see if I can... Um, I want you to all think about whether you think they're from the same dies or not. So I'm going to be quiet for a second. You can think about whether they're from the same dies. Well, let's see. See this symbol here, this N or whatever? This one looks a little closer to the edge. I really get the impression they're not the exact same dies. This O has a little break here, and the O here break is in a little different spot. So I'm going to stipulate that uh, left side dies are not the same, but we're going to check out the right side dies. So take a second, look at the right side dies, tell me if you think they're the same. Hmm. Well, they're pretty similar. 
Okay. You don't have to speak up, but I'd like you to have an opinion. So think about whether if you were doing a dye study, if you thought they were from the same dyes. And I'm going to move on a little bit and look at this spot. So I've got it greatly magnified compared to just looking at the coin or looking at a life-size photo of the coin. And I'm wondering, right here, looks a little different, very, very similar. Um, I'm not sure if I can see the second horse back here. Is this the second horse or just a sliding strike? I don't know, the arms are a very similar position. The wreath is a little slurred here. But now we're trying to distinguish uh, dies and not just strikes. Maybe this is just a, a slurred strike, a weaker strike. But maybe you can think about whether you think you'd say those are the same dies or not. Okay. Is, is, the, is there a difference between the knee position relative to the horse? Yeah. Well, I'm going to move on a little bit, give you some more chances. I'm looking here down in the exert, down on the bottom. And here's what you're seeing. This is a hoof and a hoof and a hoof and a hoof. And they're very, very similar. The hooves are up about the same amount. These look a little weaker than that. Here's a, a bud. This bud is a little bigger. Mm. I've got two observations I want to make. One is, these things are pretty close. And if a dye wears as it goes on, maybe that's just the difference between dye wear. My other observation is, on me, my screen, these things are really large. And if you were doing these from life-size photos from a coin catalog from 40 years ago, you wouldn't have nearly this detail to check it out. And I think there's a good a good thought, some of you would think it was the same die, and some of you wouldn't. Now, I'm going to move on a little bit. Uh, look at this low, this area right down here. Now, I magnified these two coins, and uh, well, yes, this one has this, but maybe that's just die wear or something. I don't know. But look at this, if I go to the front of the pod here and drop down, I have one, two, three, four, five, six beads. Here, if I go to the front and pop down, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beads up to the horizontal line. Is that enough to make them different dies? Well, hmm, okay, I'm moving on. Here's the top of the coins. Here's the, the head of victory. Here's the head of the chariot driver. And now look at the beads here. Look at the beads here. This coin, by the way, is an ANS coin um, that they got in 1915 from Newell. I'm absolutely convinced it's genuine. Look at this coin down here. Um, same dies? Well, it sure has a lot more beads. It, I'm gonna zoom back here. Here's what most people would look at. And I think these two look a lot like the same dies. I mean, Lots of things, hand position, all this pretty much the same. I could imagine somebody with life-size pictures from 20, 30 years ago saying they were the same dyes and moving on. But you and I now can get high-resolution pictures, and we can look at things like beating and decide if they are or they aren't. And I don't know. I'm not going to make my decision. You can make a decision. But I am going to say 
things can go wrong in a dye study. It is hard to identify dyes. Not just hard, but some published work has some identities wrong. I'll point out an article later where Oliver Hoover is reviewing a book and he finds 10 published pictures in the book that he disagrees on the dyes. And I think we need to consult a minting reenactor uh, to see how different strikes can look. And I'm going to say at the end, here's an article we need. We need somebody like Thomas Faucher or Francois de Calate, who struck a lot of coins from a modern die to publish how different they can look with pictures showing us, well, I can tell when two dies are different if they're way different, but if they're very similar, how similar can two, two strikes from the same dies look? I don't really know. Another point I want to make is lots of times the linkage is much more complicated than that simple example I showed you. And I showed you that inferences could go in the other direction if the data isn't right. And I claim the data is often not right. That's just par for the course. This stuff is hard. And we'll do numerical inferences in a bit that depend upon statistical models that don't fit numismatic data. But we can hope that doesn't matter too much. So I want to look at dye studies and the non-simplest model. Let's suppose you have a dye chart, and it turns out to look like this. Um, pretty much like last time, except for this link here. And it turns out that A is connected to B, to B, to D, to C, to B, back to A. And there's no way you can arrange that left to right. There's no way you can organize this so that they were done in a linear order. Now, if this is the chart, what is the order? Well, possibly. This is mostly the order, and capital A was used with reverse dye little b, and they felt that riddle b was pretty worn, and they would retire it. So they retired it, and they finished up, and they had a little metal left over when c was still good, but d broke. So they said, well, b wasn't all that bad. We'll use it again. So they used c with b. That's a possibility. There are lots of other possibilities for arrangement. Um, the B might be switched with the D. Well, um, the thoughts used to be, okay, you got an anvil here, and you're going to make an anvil die, and that'll be mounted in the anvil. And then the reverse die, which obviously has to be removed so you can get the coin out, is loose. Or well, maybe you could just put that in the die box and... When you take your lunch break, you set it aside, and when you come back after lunch, you use a different die by accident. Or maybe there's two anvils. Look at this. Suppose you have a die chart like this, and you have another die chart like this, and then you notice this die is the same as that die. Well, that might be two anvils. And if you don't notice one die at one anvil is the same as another die at the other anvil, so you just have this chart and this chart, then there's no need to postulate two anvils. You could just say, that's one anvil. This was used first. This was used second. Or maybe this was used first and that was used second because there's no overlap. There's nothing to tell you. It wasn't just two separate groups, chains, that didn't get linked. Your sample wasn't thorough enough to link them. However, if B1 is the same as C2, maybe there were two anvils going and they had a pile die and they moved from one to the other. Okay, or here's the exact same links with only D2 used again with C2 later. So that whole thing, which we were thinking might be two anvils, can be done more easily with one anvil and one reuse with the die box. Now, these two were actually the same. These two were actually the same. And here's a discouraging theorem. 
any die chart can be created with a single anvil and a die box, just re reusing the reverse dies occasionally. Tell you, that's pretty discouraging. It's going to be a little hard to put things in chronological order using a die study unless it's remarkably simple, which it sometimes is. But here's a die study I participated in, published by Martin Beckman, who did 99.9% .9 of the work. And here's a die chart associated with Faustina. And these little numbers here are how many confirming examples he had of these gold coins of Faustina. Look at this chart. This reverse is connected to this obverse, this obverse, this obverse, and that obverse. And these obverses are connected to this reverse and that reverse, and this reverse is connected to these obverses. And the chart is immensely complicated. I think we can probably assert that these two were used simultaneously. But putting these all in order is going to be really difficult because this, this whole line could be moved up a bunch. There's no linear order to this. You're going to get an awful lot of die studies where the chart is very complicated. So I'm going to move on to numerical inferences. And I want to talk about coverage, which is a very nice concept and very useful. I'm going to make a hypothetical um, issue in which one die produced 10,000 coins, one produced 20, one produced 30, one produced 40. For 100,000 coins produced by the four dies. And let's suppose we take a sample and we see this die, this die, and this die. I'm going to call that coverage 90% because we call, saw coins um, responsible. We saw dies of coins responsible for 90,000 out of 100,000 coins. That's 90% coverage. Here's sample two. We see this die, this die, and this die, but we're missing this die. We're missing 30,000 coins. Gives us 70% coverage. And here's another hypothetical sample. We see this die, this die, and this die, but we're missing this die that was responsible for 40,000 coins. That's 60% coverage. We can't know the coverage, it's a feature of the sample, but we can estimate it, and it's really nice. The estimator really works well. The estimator is robust, that's a technical term from statistics, which means works pretty well even if the hypotheses don't hold. There are confidence intervals for it, so we can get a feeling for approximately how accurate we think it is, and it also works for any categorization, not just dyes. Remember early on in my talk, I talked about how you could categorize things and they didn't have to be die identities. They could be legend identities or type identities. We get exactly the same thing for any other categorization. Um, we can think of an R5 coin, an RIC6, as being unique in the sense only one was seen. And we can do that same sort of thing for dies. Only one of that example was seen. And it's a, there's a good method for estimating the coverage. We need the number of coins in the sample, n for number, um, d for the number of dies, 1 for the number of dies seen exactly once. And the S coverage estimate is this. Very simple. Take the number of singletons, divide by the number of coins in the sample. That's how much you haven't seen. 1 minus that is how much you have seen. And it's not particular to numismatics. You could do that for anything. Now, if you want to estimate the original number of dies used to strike an issue, first of all, the obverse and reverse are treated separately. It doesn't have anything to do with links, nothing. It only has to do with how many of each type of die you saw. So N is the number. D is the number of different dies. D1 is the number of dies seen once to like that. I'm going to give you an example, and this is data from Decalitai's gold mine books on uh, die studies. And here's how you read this chart. Some dies were observed twice, about 80 of them. 
uh, I don't have a one here, but there were 98 that were observed exactly once and about 50 that were observed three times. And this happens to be a pretty large die study, 1,320 coins, because it's new style tetradrams and it's pretty easy to tell them apart. And you get a nice smooth curve like this. Uh, Tikalatai has over 600 die studies in there and I charted them all. And most of the charts look like this with a fairly smooth curve going down unless the sample size is very small. And D0 is the number of dyes observed exactly zero times, namely the ones you didn't observe. And that's what we want to know. We want to know how many dyes there were that we didn't get to see. So I'd like you to take a second and extrapolate this up and take a guess at how many dyes you think there were that we didn't see. Now make it a little easier, I'm making the picture bigger. So the question is, where does that curve intersect the y-axis? Pick a number. Well, um, I'm going to pick 130 or so. Well, if you use numerical methods, you get, here's the original data, 375 different dyes, 98 singletons. The coverage estimate the part we didn't see is 98 over 1320. Uh, that's about 7% we didn't see. So this means you got a pretty thorough sample. You saw dyes responsible for 93% of the coins. And I think that's probably quite accurate because this is a very large sample. The estimate that comes out of the formulas turns out to be 511. So the number we didn't see is 511 minus 375 is 136. Did you guess about 136? Well, here's a confidence interval, um, about 487 to 536. So the number of missing dies was about 112 up to 161, somewhere in there, more than likely. If you guessed that, you think you realize the value of these sorts of charts. Now this chart uses the so-called geometric model. A geometric model is very common in engineering because it is the time until failure for lots of things. And this uh, chart has two different interpretations. I'm gonna just talk about the triangles right now. Uh, maybe you did a die study. If you had a geometric model, you'd expect mostly missing and then singletons and doubletons and tripletons and quadrupletons like that. But it also can be interpreted at the same time as uh, showing die lifetimes. Make this 5,000 instead of five and 10,000. And you'll have some dies that break right away and some dies will produce 1,000 coins and some will produce 2,000 like this. I actually got data from the US Mint and this is surprising but in absolutely modern dyes made by the U.S. Mint, they sometimes break right away, sometimes on the very first strike. You'd think that technology would make dyes that were great and would all last 10,000 coins or 15,000 coins. Nope. They break early, and some of them last a heck of a long time, even now, up to a million coins. So here's what I'm going to advise you to do to estimate the number of dyes. Create that type of frequency graph. If, see the if, it's fairly smooth and eyeball it, and you've got a good idea of how many were missing dyes there were. If it's not fairly regular, figure out why using the rest of this talk. And you better explain to your readers why. And show that chart to your readers anyway and then supplement the chart with numerical results from these formulas. Now, most die study charts have more singletons than any other frequency, more singletons than doubletons, more doubletons than tripletons like that. If they're large samples, that's almost always the case. Uh, the only exceptions are really small samples and extremely thorough samples. And here's what the geometric model gives you. 
I'm going to concentrate on this factor. Let's ignore this for a second. Just look at this. Let's suppose you saw 100 dies and you thought you'd seen half of them. Well, then your estimate would be 200. 100 divided by half. But if you see 100 dies, not all dies produce the same number of coins, and it's likely that you've seen dies that produce more coins, and you miss the dies that saw fewer coins. So this factor, which is a little bit bigger than one, inflates this number to account for the fact that you've probably seen common dies as opposed to the ones that produce only a few coins. And this is justified by the geometric model. So E is the estimated number of dies. This is the number you've seen total. And this is the number of singletons. And I'm telling you, please don't cite these numbers without demonstrating you understand and have dealt with the caveats that I'm going to run past you here in a second. There's lots of things that can go wrong. Now, it's possible you're going to play around with some old data and you don't know the number of singletons because back in the old days, they didn't necessarily record that in their article. With random samples, it ought to give you almost exactly the same result. And it's much simpler. It doesn't have um, singletons required. But the singleton one is a little bit more accurate, accurate if you happen to have the singletons. And then here's a confidence interval, uh, fairly complicated here. And I remark that all these formulas, and in particular the uh, confidence interval formula, are asymptotically derived. What that means is if you could run the sample size and the number of dies off to infinity, which you can't, this formula would work great. But if the numbers aren't pretty large, <laughs> there's some problems with this stuff. And uh, statisticians spend a lot of time in introductory statistics courses talking to students about whether the numbers are large enough to believe the results. And they usually say, if numbers are less than five, you can't believe them. And if numbers are bigger than 30, you probably can. In between, it's a little tricky. I'd really much rather look at one of those die charts and see if it looked constant than believe one of these formulas. Now, for some caveats. First of all, you should realize that all statistical methods have hypotheses. They're of the form, if this is the case, then this method will give you a good result. They should well, work well if the hypotheses hold. <laughs> but they might not work well if the hypotheses do not hold. And let's face it, in numismatic samples, the hypotheses don't hold. So we just need to hope the methods work anyway. And the researcher should convert, convince the reader he has reason to believe the sample's okay to use anyway. Let me talk about this. All of statistics, and in particular, our estimators assume the sample is random. What does random mean? Random means that every coin produced has an equal chance of being included in the sample independently of all the other coins. And that's clearly false. Maybe it's close enough. Look, let's suppose you've got a big hoard. Hordes have too many die duplicates. And that'll be visible on the die frequency chart because they'll have some die that came up 20 times or something like that. That yields an overestimate of the coverage and an underestimate of the number of dies. And it's obvious that a hoard may overrepresent coins distributed together. Lots of times you'll have a hoard that has 50 coins from one die pair because they're fresh. They never got separated after having been from the mint. So they got distributed together, they stayed together, they got buried together, we find them together and they're not independently in the sample. Or you might get a hoard of coins sent to Gaul and completely miss that part of the issue that was sent to Croatia, or maybe at a slightly different time. So that tends to underestimate the number of dies. But then again, maybe you're getting your sample from museum collections. And museum collections often have too few die duplicates. 
because they don't really need die duplicates. They're trying to represent the coinage. Collections, if I had two from exactly the same die, I might get rid of the second one or get something different. And if you have too few die duplicates, that makes your sample too large for the number of dies you've seen multiple times, and you get an overestimate of the number of dies. So what I want you to do is convince me that you've balanced the hordes and the museums. Now, if we're going to talk about coverage, it's non-parametric. It has almost no assumptions other than randomness. And it works pretty well even with some non-randomness. So I'm going to say use the coverage estimator. That's really important. It tells me how hard you've looked for everything. Um, here's a big problem with the formulas. The methods assume that data is correct, which is often doubtful, and die identities can easily be misidentified. Um, the geometric model estimator, that's the one I advocate. Um, assumes die production is geometrically distributed. I've got some modern evidence for that. I've got a lot of ancient evidence for that, but uh, my ancient evidence is uh, Rome Republican and uh, from Decalotai, which is Greek. So I can't be absolutely sure it applies to um, late Roman, Byzantine, stuff like that. Uh, recently, I've looked at some data from the Islamic 13th century. I can't really be sure the geometric model fits there. Um, everything assumes the sample is random. And of course, like I said, that's false, but what can we do about it? Nothing. We'll just use these ideas anyway. But uh, one thing you can do is you can look at your data. Here's some actual data, again, from Decalatai, um, where sample size was nice and big, 594. 163 different dies, 110 singletons, 13 doubletons, 10 tripletons. And look at this. Here's my chart. Wow. I saw 13 dies, not me. Somebody saw 13 dies twice, 10 dies three times, like that. And this part of the chart looks pretty normal. And what's going on up here? How did they get so many singletons? And by the way, I'm going back one. There are also dies with 20, 98, uh, 28, and 97 coins. And this um, die study relied heavily on a single hoard, not completely, but heavily. And I'll bet you anything, those 97 coins all came from a single hoard, and they weren't independent and they're not on this chart either because they'd be way over here to the right on the chart so what's my reaction my reaction is this person is distinguishing dyes that i think it might have really been the stain and they find minor differences that maybe were due to dye wear or strike that um, I can't really tell. I'd like to see the original data. I'd like to see things that were different because really, I don't care if you believe in the geometric model or not. Any model gives you a tendency toward a smooth curve when you have good size numbers, like numbers bigger than five, and that thing jumped up too high. I wonder. I uh, recommend you both show the frequency chart so people can see whether they believe it all. And uh, maybe you don't like this word, but I'd doctor the data. I'd remove some of the hoard duplicates and I'd say, hey, I saw 97 coins that were fresh from the same dies. I'm knocking that down to five or something before I use my formulas. So here's some conclusions. This is important. This chronological theory where I made some die charts and said you could put things in order doesn't require die varieties. It would work fine for other varieties, legend varieties, type varieties, 
connecting emperors. They, there's a lot of things that you would do just by thinking. I don't think you need anything clever to think of that. Um, this is a, an important point. Chronology and mint organization are identifiable only in some easy cases. I'll go with simultaneous things. If I've got an obverse and a reverse on a single coin, I'm going to believe they were struck simultaneously. And if I can link them up, those things are going to be pretty close to simultaneous. But I showed you uh, something about men organization where I showed you a case of possibly two anvils or possibly one anvil with a reused die. The two anvils had to reuse dies too. So there was no reason to postulate two anvils. It's going to be very hard to get much detail about mint organization from a die study because too often the studies are like that one I showed you of Faustina Sr. Complicated as all get out. You probably can say some were issued at the same time. Next, dies are hard to identify and mistakes can make a huge difference because you could make a link that wasn't there, putting a couple things simultaneous that weren't, or reversing the order of a chain, or connecting two chains that were really separate. Maybe it was two anvils, two separate chains. This is really hard. And I'm the numbers guy, and I tell you, make those charts. And don't believe the numerical estimates without a clear discussion of why the sample's okay. The sample isn't okay. It's clearly biased. But there are two possible biases and they work against one another. And if you do some coins from museums and some coins from hordes, I think it comes out about even. And you might as well use these numerical estimates. I think they're pretty good then. Particularly if your coverage is high. Try to get your coverage up around 90% or higher. Otherwise, you're missing a lot of stuff. Now, here are some of the references I was mentioning. This is the most recent article of mine, and I like it for the formula used for estimating the number of dies. This one uses a formula for confidence intervals that I think is good. This is the article on the theory of linkage. This one is uh, pretty much outdated except for just the discussion. Here's where I got an absolute ton of data and I couldn't have done any of this without the Calatize assembling this data. And here's an article in which the author notes 10 misidentified dyes in a publication. I think that that's just par for the course. I think lots of dyes are misidentified on a regular basis. You're welcome to contact me at that. And I have a couple of other things I want to say that I'm not going to discuss that maybe some of you have thought about. There's the possibility of hubs making dyes so similar they're hard to tell apart. There's a possibility of retouched dyes, maybe making you think that it was two dyes when it was one retouched. Lighting at the angle of the photograph, flan struck at an angle twice. There's lots of potential problems. I once read, and I don't remember where, an article by a reenactor who was doing turtles, Greek turtles. And he said from the same die, he got a turtle with a very short neck and a turtle with a significantly longer neck. And I'm sure that they would have been judged as two different dies by a person doing a die study. I wish I could find that. What I would, um, I'll um, talk about that a little bit more in a second. Like here's an article in 2018, uh, which mentions the extremely close resemblance of dyes. So now you have the chance of getting singletons because you decide they're different, or doubletons because you decide they're the same, and that makes a huge difference in coverage and uh, dye estimates. How can we be sure that they were told apart correctly? Um, one of the things that article suggests is multiple dies set right next to each other in an anvil 
So you could possibly get brockages struck from two different eyes. Really? Here's an older article in which uh, Gordian III was in a hoard represented by 662 coins and 660 different dies. Really? Hmm. If a chain is dated in a long time interval, like maybe a Greek chain, could have been issued in a week or it could have been issued over 40 years. The link charts don't tell you that alone. You're going to have to get other things. You might be issued in, uh, interested in the number of coins struck per die, and I think probably there are people who could talk on that for an hour, but I'm not going to go into that. I'm just mentioning that that's another issue related to this. So I am going to suggest that all the images in any future die study be archived somewhere, um, maybe at the ANS. And I'm quite convinced the two researchers presented with the same sample might find different dye identities. Um, I was talking to some people who do dye studies who told me they wouldn't trust any dye study from before 1990 because it was necessarily done from life-size images, mostly from coin catalogs, and sometimes life-size images sent to them by museums. And you already saw earlier in my talk how close dyes can be to one another. And with life-size images at 300 dpi, there are things you won't be able to tell apart, and you might decide a really different dyes. So what I'd like to see is an archive with high-resolution images of everything so we can go back and decide if we believe it. Researchers, if it was before commuter computer manipulation of high resolution images, I'm not sure you can really trust them. And I'd like to see an article, no, I'm not going to write it, from a minting reenactor on strikes from the same die and how different they can be. Because I showed you that Masana tetradrum and you were seeing differences. Are those differences because they're from different dyes? Or could two strikes from the same die be that different? Well, how do we know? I haven't seen any studies on how different strikes from the same die can be. Um, maybe we can get a minting reenactor, uh, and some have already struck 5,000 or more coins, to take the coins that look as much different as possible and illustrate them for us nice and large. I don't want to see life-size images printed on paper, I can't tell them apart. And maybe uh, with different lighting, etc. So I'll consider that uh, done. And I'm going to uh, shrink my window is unless someone wants to see one of these slides again. Okay. Um, second, I'm going over to the chat. Why can't we do this comparison numerically? What do you mean? I don't understand what that question means. This is Francis. <clears throat> Why can't you take your two pictures? Uh oh, what's up here? There's noise. Um, uh, you have pictures of this, and you can compare it by some kind of uh, artificial intelligence or whatever least square or whatever you want it to ah, find yeah. some common points or not. The ANS how, can you say, how, can, how can't you use the, these numerical methods to tell the dyes apart? The ANS had a talk on this earlier uh, in which uh, a graduate student uh, used an um, image comparison program to try, to try to do this. And there are lots of problems with that. Uh, he thought he got maybe about 90% of the way, but lots of coins, like the coins I showed the two Masana tetradrams I showed, the edges can be well different even if they're from the same die. So if you put that into a computer program, the computer program says, oh, these are different. They've got different edges. So then you have to figure out what to do about the edges. You have to figure about what to do about dings that happened after the coin was struck. You have to figure out what to do about where. And so you can get part of the way, 
but you're still going to have to eyeball it near the end. And, you know, if this program, if this Zoom program had a clever thing like some teaching programs had where you could vote on whether they were the same guy or not, I'd like to see the 60 participants vote on whether those chariot side were the same guy or not, and we wouldn't all agree. So at some case, it's a little bit human. Ah, the, uh, so I'm gonna move on to the next question. The turtle die thing is, by, okay, I'm gonna check that one out. Thank you. Um, um, this was um, Warren, she, she in fact created exactly what you're saying. She made um, with her husband an enormous number uh, created these dyes, and in fact, I think some of them are at the ANS. There, she she died rather uh, too young, and but these two articles that you see um, that were published have exactly what you're describing. You know how different these things look, but I can't remember in which of these two it is. Terrific. Okay, well, I just think, I know this sort of stuff. If you can't tell what was from the same die, how can you be sure on these things that are very close when a lot of my people that I consult with say, these things are very close and I don't know if they're different dies or not. Um, uh, sorry, Warren, you can tell terrorists from the airports and picture from airport. How can we tell coins in the, the different dies than uh, on, on the picture? Well, I think if there were as much interest in telling different dyes as there were in telling terrorists, then maybe we could. <laughs> yeah. um, someone asked the question, has the ANS released the digital dye study software by Zach Taylor yet? Somebody else at the ANS is in better position to answer that than I am. Oh, I'm actually here um, and we're working on it diligently. Um, and Warren, you did mention that uh, the software can be uh, confused by edges, but we actually do account for that. We ignore the edges of coins. Yeah, and if, if, if you ignore edges of coins, then uh, I, the last image I showed in the Sinai tetradrams were beating. And I think everybody would agree the beating was different. You're absolutely yeah. correct. So there's so why um, the rest of the coins look very very similar, but the beating was different. Um, yeah. uh, if you yeah. were the beating, maybe that's the key point. I don't know. Oh, no, you can't. That's the part. Yeah, you're absolutely correct, and it's definitely a thing where we're looking to make that a configurable option because like cracking around the edges makes it difficult because if you look at that it might be picked out as something that's significant when in fact we kind of want to ignore those types of things rather than a feature from the die but yeah those are great points yeah well i i agree that we're going to have to have the software ignore stuff like the edges and i thought it was a good idea to get down to uh 90 percent assurance that these are pretty close and now we'll eyeball them. That seems reasonable to me. And uh, it cuts down the work quite a bit. I have another question here. To what extent and in what ways do fakes impact dye studies? I think that's a really good question because I've seen dye studies where quite a bit of the material was pulled off the internet and it was fairly recent. And if you're going to pull your images off of eBay, um, there's no real assurance that they aren't possibly modern fakes. I think that could uh, make quite a difference. And authenticity is a big deal. And I don't do dye studies. I analyze numbers, make charts, uh, I'm uh, going to let other people decide whether those are the same dyes and whether the coins are authentic or not. But I can bring up the issue and tell you, you got to be pretty careful with this. If you get a 1915 coin, it was in the Newell collection, you probably figure it's not a modern fake. Um, uh, Al B. Hello? wants to 
comment by microphone. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, a great talk. I really appreciate this. Um, I wanted to comment about a little dye study I did some years ago and um, some information that I got out of it. Um, I wasn't trying really to do a chronology of different dyes, uh, but I was studying Bolivian coinage in a transitional year, uh, 1859, 1860. They went to the Latin Monetary Union standard. There were a number of different obverse dyes, some very rare, some very common. And um, the common ones, I found all sorts of, you know, different dyes. But one thing I discovered was that one of the very rare obverse dyes persisted over both years, 1859 and 1860, and every one of them was mated to a different reverse dye, which implied to me that that obverse dye being quite rare, there were only like six or seven known, um, a number of pieces, um, that that dye may have represented some kind of special striking circumstance. And they used that dye over a period of a couple of years when they were in transition to the Latin Monetary Union standard in order to test the setup or test something in the manufacturing process. Because that obverse dye appeared over two years. And even though there were only a few examples extant, they were always mated to a different reverse dye. So I thought that was an interesting uh, conclusion that I temporarily reached um, just based on the fact that one dye was always mated to a different reverse dye over apparently an extended period of time. Yes, that's quite interesting. And you wouldn't be this only person to have found obverse dyes uh, made it to different reverse dyes or even different reverse types. Uh, that happens surprisingly often. So early in my talk, I talked about the simplest model. Often, the simplest model isn't correct where dyes are used to exhaustion and replaced. And sometimes it's a little difficult to explain. How did this obverse dye get used with so many different reverse dyes? Um, or how did this reverse dye get used with so many different obverse dyes? For example, in late Roman coinage, it's entirely possible to have a reverse dye used with three different emperors who are all minting at the same time. Uh, for instance, uh, Constantine, Crispus, and Constantine II. Uh, because something was special enough that they wanted everybody to get to get together with that reverse dye. Now, if it's a huge issue with uh, hundreds of reverse dyes, I doubt if they'd uh, single them out so specially. But for um, special issues, gold, possibly, um, you don't have dyes used to exhaustion. And you can easily imagine why that is. Maybe you don't have enough gold to use all these dyes to exhaustion. Yeah, very good point. Uh, or, as I said, a possibility may be it was some kind of test case and they wanted to identify uh, the coins during that test and they used a particular obverse dye over a long period of time. They wanted to perform this test. They were in, in the process of revamping their coinage to a new standard. And um, it at least pointed, the dye study at least pointed to that possibility. Well, yeah, I believe that dye studies don't replace thinking. Yeah, You're going to have to right. think about what's going on. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you very much. Great talk. Appreciated it. You're welcome. Warren, Warren I have a question. Um, what do you think of the notion that perhaps those dyes from Masana were uh, created by the same hub as a master for the die cutters to, to carve separate dyes? Um, on my second last slide, I said I wasn't going to talk about hubs. <laughs> hubs are a really tricky matter. Uh, there's a very nice article by Clive Stannard that says, nope. And there are articles by other people that say, yep. And I don't have a real strong opinion wow. about it. it. You know, let me give you a parallel. 
a stirrup is a really good way to stay on a horse. And the Greeks and Romans rode horses for a thousand years without thinking of it. A hub is a really good way to make a bunch of dies. And the process is very similar to striking coins. So you'd think that the Greeks and the Romans would have thought of making hubs, at least for the main part of the design. Maybe the lettering would be separate or something like that. So you can make that argument, but I can argue that there are parallels where something simple like the stirrup wasn't thought of for a thousand years. Well, so how are we going to decide if there were hubs or not? People are going to have to do a lot of work to make that decision. And certainly in a case like that Masana thing, maybe there was a hub for the middle and somebody did the beating separately. Bing, 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 dinging a, a, some sort of cool into the edge. And that's why the beating around the edge is different, even though the middle is pretty much the same. I do not have the answer to these questions. Fortunately, I am leaving some of this for future researchers and graduate students to do. Can I make a pitch for all the dye studies um, where we have one example? Um, <laughs> So uh, recently um, was actually the idea of an ANS trustee, Dick Eitzwick. He couldn't read the old Syracuse to dare and he wanted to translate it. And the whole thing then turned into uh, the new book, The Coins Artist, which uh, Wolfgang Fischer both many um, authored. But I, I worked on redoing the, the study. And when you compare this uh, study that's over 100 years with the current one, you get more specimens, but you get no new dyes virtually and you get no mistakes. Um, I think that speaks A for today, but also for the methodology and using coins as well as plaster cast as they often did for this, but also the old photographs they use. So I would say the larger the sample, and this is true for Syracuse and for many of the Sicilian studies that we have um, I think they hold up better than some other studies. Excellent. I'm uh, very pleased with that. And I think Greek studies have uh, an advantage in that many of the coins are so valuable that they're worth publishing. And so you really can get a pretty complete coverage. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I think there are some Greek um, issues where we've got virtually 100% of the dyes. Um, now, someone asked me, what do I think about the possibility of the second Masana tetradram being a counterfeit? That's not for me to decide. I decline. Very, very diplomatic. Oh. Oh. Actually, we should ask David <laughs> to decide. <laughs> I, well, I, I did have my, uh, my concerns, my immediate concerns, <laughs> but, and, and literally those concerns had nothing to do with uh, even a comparison of the, the two specimens. Um, clearly the ANS specimen, you know, exhibited everything I would want in a, a genuine coin, you know, and, and then you provided the pedigree, which, you know, that certainly adds credence to it. But the the other specimen, it gave me a bad feeling. And now again, you know, photographs can lie. So I mean, maybe in hand, there's a, uh, I would have a very different reaction to it. But based solely on the photo, I'm, I, I think the different, and it would make sense that the differences we're observing, these minute differences, um, you know, of course, accepting the possibility of the, the central device being a hub, um, as you had uh, suggested might be the case, you know, that, that scenario aside, I would be extremely uh, cautious on the, uh, the second specimen. I, I love the talk, Warren. This is fantastic. It's really Thank good you. to see you. What fantastic work. Thank you. May I uh, ask and uh, do a remark? Um, Hello, can you hear me? Yep, hear you fine, Matthias. Hi, 
I'm uh, Matthias. Uh, I'm assistant of Stefan Heidemann, and uh, I'm glad for, uh, to have the chance to um, participate in this uh, presentation. And we had already uh, contact via email in 2016. Um, I worked on nearly 500 uh, coins, very homogeneous, from, uh, so from one year and one mint. And I did a die study on this, and I did also other die studies. And um, I just want to make two remarks and um, have uh, two questions also. Uh, so uh, one remark is uh, that I worked uh, with your um, estimators and your formulas, and I put them in Excel, uh, um, in, in the Excel uh, folders, and uh, it works very well to to um, to go th quickly through different. Um, um, okay. die studies and to yeah. estimate uh, how many dice yeah. were used probably yeah. um, and um, I used also a software to make uh, die links which is called YAD and I found it very helpful because you can um, move uh, the, the, the coins or uh, the, the different dice around and uh, insert uh, others uh, which is really very helpful to, to get the idea uh, how the die chain may look or not uh, so you mentioned the problems um, uh, a question that I have is um, in your um, texts, uh, in, in your el elder one, you uh, worked with the parameter two. Uh, in the new one, you changed it to parameter one. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And uh, did I get it right from these texts that uh, the parameter two fits better to collections which probably where the sample stems probably from a uh, um, a collection or um, a museum, something like that, uh, which is not that ram uh, random like others. Can we say that? Or is it, why did you change yeah. this parameter? Okay. Um, now we understand that I now believe parameter one is much better to use. And that's the so-called geometric model. Yeah. The parameter two fit some data that was largely gathered from museums and had more different um, dies than it should have. So we needed to tamp down the number in the estimator and the estimator with parameter two gives less. And um, Charles Carter had written an article which said that if you got your data from three museums, that would probably be random enough. And I no longer believe that. I believe you need a good mixture of museum stuff and hoard stuff because the museums bias the result in one direction and the hordes bias the result in the other direction. Mm. And a lot of the hoard bias can be discovered by looking at one of those charts like I was talking about and seeing that there were way too many die duplicates of some die or other. And by modifying that, you can get about right. Well then, Takalatai came out with his two books on consolidating die studies and all the data with the singletons, doubletons, tripletons, and it was ready to go. So it was much easier for me to see which parameter actually fit the data because I had a lot more data. Prior to that, I had some data from the US Mint that we'd solicited and uh, some ancient data, but not a lot. And when I used those 600 sets of data, I could see parameter one, the classic failure time data for engineering theory fit really well. And uh, you should almost always, unless your sample is extremely thorough, get more singletons than doubletons, more doubletons than tripletons, and get that swoop downward like I was showing in that theoretical chart. And if your sample size is really pretty small, so you only got two singletons and maybe three doubletons and the numbers are less than five, well, then I expect some irregularity, even if the model's right. But uh, you, should, you should mostly see something pretty smooth. And if you don't, figure out if you can figure out a way to explain it away. I think that's the point why uh, a discussion of the, the sample you use is uh, one of the most important parts uh, when you present uh, the results. Uh, in my case, um, it's pretty clear that uh, all the most of the uh, coins were mint fresh, so uh, they maybe they they stayed together since they were struck. But the the amount of coins that were struck was such huge that we maybe can say that the sample uh, 
is like random but within the same year and uh, so they they were mixed maybe uh, at the mid so it it was is one of my points uh, that I did have to discuss and uh, I came over it uh, to test both models and uh, that's why I wanted to ask this um, and maybe a further question if I may uh, do you think uh, if we have a not such random sample we can uh, improve this uh, by adding just all coins of that type we can get from collections uh, in my case, it's, uh, it's uh, Islamic coins, uh, so I use uh, very much Sino, for example. If we just add coins, all we can get, does this make a, a random sample in your eyes? Yeah. No, but it might be good enough. I had one slide in there, which would be anathema to a real statistician, which said, doctor your sample. And I think if you're going to find that you have a sample that's largely from hordes and or might be from hordes, and you've got uh, 25 coins from the same dye pair that are fresh. Time to doctor the sample before you start using the, the formulas. Now you, you can draw the chart and anybody will see that there are little X's way off to the right in the chart and that something's funny going on there. But if you're gonna put them into formulas, then a number pops out the other end and the reader doesn't know that you've used um, doubtful data. So you write in your description, hey, I had 25 coins from the same dies from the same horde. I'm gonna knock that down to five just to make my sample a little smaller because I realize it's not random. Yeah. Yeah. So that, uh, I don't know if, you, if I'm on anymore, but if you can hear me, yeah. there's a 20 and a 27, which mm, they're quite possible. They might be random, but I like the idea that you had uh, more singletons and doubletons and tripletons. The quadrupleton, these numbers are fairly small. Six isn't a huge number, that could happen. I think this is a very possible sort of chart. And I certainly wouldn't go with the negative binomial model in this case. I don't think there's any evidence to think uh, we shouldn't use the um, geometric model. I'll bet you if you ran your sample again for a few more years and found a few more, you'd come up with another five dice, maybe more. Thanks for showing us that. In the collection that I asked you to, to take a look at earlier this year, I was very much concerned about where those coins had come from. Uh, I used a number of samples from, from the Zeno database of Islamic coins. This was a group of coins that came from one mint in one, in one year, 646 of the Hijra, uh, the same mint, same year. And I discovered upon looking up various things on Zeno that uh, I had uh, one or two cases where somebody had bought a coin, put it on Zeno, then sold the coin to someone else who put that coin on Zeno. Um, so I had to be very careful of that. Uh, there weren't many, there was no hoard that I knew of. Um, there were a few in museums. But what I did do was I had access to all of the uh, sales and auction catalogs of Steve Album, who's the major dealer of Islamic coins, going back to about 1971. So I could see these showing up uh, in dribs and drabs. And uh, when I talked about it with Steve uh, at some length, uh, he talked to me about the ways in which hordes or pieces of hordes will show up on the market. Um, but it, it really does make a difference. We have another horde, we have a big Il Ilkhanid horde at the University of Michigan, where um, I think the, the statistics would be much harder to do because of the nature of the horde. Uh, and I wanna say just here, uh, again, once again, that uh, uh, when I began looking at the dialings and things like that, I'd like to say that, that uh, Professor Esty helped me enormously and I'm very grateful. Thank you. I'm viewing Hilbert's screen. Hilbert, do you want to tell us what we're seeing? 
Yes. So that's the graph for the hemihectus. There we have much more uh, specimens, but for each die, only singletons. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, my first reaction is those, let's see, what does that 67 one mean? Uh, where do, what six, 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 it's first one, that's yeah. uh, one that, die that has uh, 67 uh, specimens. Yeah. And then we have one die with 45 specimens and one die with two specimens. Yep. Okay, that's a fairly unusual chart. Really it is. I have <laughs> thought a, a lot about this, but uh, <laughs> Your formula gives <laughs> there are no no unknown dice for this uh, for this fraction. Yeah. And if you just eyeballed it, you'd think the only other number that's going to show up is one because there's no curvature to your chart at all. Um, yes. My first reaction is those sixty-seven coins must have been fresh from the same die in one hoard, Maybe. probably with the forty-five, and that also. Maybe um, what 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 do we do with this one and this, with this? There are many many dice with many coins. So do we have to cut here? Do we have to cut here or here? How do we doctor this graph? Okay, I'll tell you. Don't use the formula at all. Just give the graph and say this is a little hard to explain, but we think we've seen most because. The uh, number above zero doesn't look like it could be huge. The coverage is about uh, 97, 99, also extremely high coverage for this. Uh, yeah. so, so probably we, we saw every die. You've seen every yeah. die, is that right? I think that's quite possible. May I say that I have more and more the impression that for the electron coinage, which is what we're dealing with here, that maybe this needs a completely different system because I've had similar problems and I would almost go into some of archaic and classical where because so much comes from one single hoard and for example, your uh, famous Sinope example you're giving in your book as well, I'm just redoing this completely, this whole study and I got it. It's all one single hoard, the whole die study. And um, it, it just, a lot of it doesn't work and it's very dangerous sometimes to just be using this um, in, in a sort of simplistic way, as you're saying, which is of course what I would like to do, but can't. Um, may I show you one other slide from, I've Please. done a lecture just a few days ago. You see it now? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, in the, the, with the 10 dies, which are which were known in 1985, uh, the covering estimator would be here. And mm -hmm. with the 29 dies, uh, which we knew in 2000, the coverage is nearly 9.9. .9. And in twenty in twenty twenty we have only two more dice. So that's almost staying the same very high. So and here you have the uh ninety-five uh, oh, the ninety-five uh, uh percent intervals. So in nineteen eighteen in nineteen eighty-five you could say that between zero and point uh, almost 90% of the coins were struck with this 10 dies. And in, in, two, in 2000, that was pretty close. It was the 90% interval is about 0.9. And it doesn't change in the last 20 years. Now, let me make clear that the coverage is a feature of the sample and not of the original population. So what that confidence interval was saying is that in 1985, your 47% or whatever 
that that group alone covered about 40 47% of the coins being issued but it might have been much lower or much yeah, yeah. higher it might be the, here or the here this yeah. 95% certainty yes but yeah. here you can see uh, you can say it, it almost with 95% certainty you can say that uh, Ninety percent of the cover of the coinage were struck with these dice. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so my my uh, reaction is, it's time to stop gathering more examples because you've seen what there is to see, and mm -hmm. it's true there might be another die out there, but it's not going to teach you anything you don't already know from the sample you have. Yes, here and here there. Are, there are no, there are no many, no any more uh, uh, dice coming up. So you see, in the last twenty years, there are two dice have ca have come up. So are pretty uh, complete. Yes. Okay. You're done. Yes. Uh. Well, thank you, Mr. S. D. I I hope everyone enjoyed. We had a lot of discussion this time. I think this <laughs> this was a great talk. Um, we will not be having another Money Talks this month, but we will be live streaming the annual meeting on October 24th. So all of our curators and staff are going to be giving presentations on what we've done this year. Um, so I hope you guys can join us for that. And again, to those special guests who are invited who are not members, I hope you decide to join the ANS. We'd love to have you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Warren. Thank you, Juan. Amazing. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices.